Let's talk more about this, okay? Kim Potter's trial as it begins, uh, host and legal analyst of the Law and Crime Network, Terry Austin, is also following it. Terry, what do you think the likelihood is of a conviction for Potter, and what different charges does she face here? I think the likelihood is great that she will definitely be convicted of either manslaughter one or manslaughter two. Those are the two charges that she's currently facing right now. Manslaughter one is a reckless standard, meaning that she basically had no regard for life. And manslaughter two is the lesser of those charges, meaning that it was an accident, it was culpable negligence, but she should be held accountable. And basically, Kira, the difference is really 15 years and 10 years. But I do think the jury is going to come back with one or the other of those charges. So jury selection actually begins today. So what do you think that process is going to look like, given the high profile nature of this case? Well, Judge Chu has allowed cameras into the court, which is interesting because initially she had said no cameras, but because of COVID, she's now decided the cameras can be in that courtroom. And her style is very interesting. She has this soft, captivating voice, and she sort of soothes the jury and makes them feel very comfortable, thank them sincerely for being there, saying that they are really serving their country. So far, the selection has gone well. She did the preliminary instructions, and then she individually questioned juror number two, and he was accepted by both sides. So they're continuing that process, and based on her time schedule, I think she will be able to finish the trial by Christmas Eve is what she told the jury. So do you think Potter will, will take the stand, and could that help or hurt her in this case? You know, that's always the million dollar question, whether or not the defendant should take the stand. I think it all depends on how that evidence goes in. I think the defense is going to hold that card close to the vest. It could help her because she could describe what is going on in her mind, what she was thinking at the time. I think the jury is going to want to know how she you know, whether or not she panicked. Did she bring her training into question? And how could she have pulled the trigger on a gun versus a taser? So it could help if she could explain that thought process, but it could also hurt if, in fact, that cross-examination goes poorly. Right, and I think that's what, you know, folks are really interested in. How, how could she mistake a taser for a gun? You know, there's a weight difference, color difference, a feel. Uh, it, and you even see in the partner that she's with, um, you see the bright yellow taser uh, on her partner. So it, it's very curious uh, for sure. And, you know, the incident occur, uh, occurred just about 10 miles from where Derek Chauvin uh, was standing trial at the time for the murder of George Floyd. So how does, you know, both the time and location of this shooting impact this case, you think? I think it does impact this case. There's so much going on in Minnesota. Like you said, that George Floyd verdict and the fact that they have had shootings like this before where officers have been involved with killing other people. So you've had the uh, Castile case, obviously, and the Mohammed Noor case as you mentioned, George Floyd, and now this case. So there are a multitude of cases where you've had officers who have been charged with killing individuals. And I think that the jury is aware of that. Hopefully that will not influence their decision in this case because they should make their decision in this case just based on the evidence that comes in here. And this is a very different case, I think. I think the jury might be able to understand that she didn't initially intend to kill him and that it could very well have been an accident, certainly based on what she said during that body cam video. You know, before I let you go, Terry, we follow so many different trials together, and this one is definitely unique, and a lot of people are paying attention to it for many reasons. What do you find the most interesting? Because it really, you know, following so many cases, especially with you, that involve weapons, right? Um, what, what stands out to you about this? Why do you think this, this is such a unique trial? I think this is unique because you have such divergent views about what happened. You have those individuals who think clearly this was an accident because you hear her voice. You see what's going on. She's so upset afterwards. On the other hand, you have Dante Wright's family and others who support the family, Ben Crump, et cetera, 
saying this should have been a murder charge, this was intentional. I listened actually to some of the press conference and some of those family members definitely thought that this was intentional, that she had targeted individuals. So it's very interesting to me that you can have a case where people really have such differing views on whether this was an accident or whether she intentionally killed. Terry Austin, thank you so much. Hi everyone, George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.